spoilers for Season 3, Episode 8 of Only Murders in the Building. For eight weeks, we've asked who killed Ben Glenroy. We knew it wasn't Greg, who was arrested at the end of Episode 2. Do we think it's Loretta, arrested at the end of Episode 8? Some things we got right, some things we got wrong. And there are some context clues in Episode 8 that a lot more we said was correct. And our theory at the very end of this podcast is going to point out the key thing to watch in Episode 9. But for a moment here at the start, let's try to solve Death Rattle Dazzle. What if none of the Pickwick triplets did it? Then who killed this woman with the Death Rattle? Is she the mother? Would the father have killed her? You wouldn't think so. Ty is barely a character. Let's rule out the father. Would the godmother have killed the mother to take her place? Well, I don't know about Kimber, but this character, who I assume is Kimber's understudy, is so excited by Charles completing the Pickwick triplet song, she looks guilty to me. If Charles's character, the constable, is accusing someone else, he's probably not the killer. Loretta's the nanny is the most likely suspect. Does that make her guilty? What of the detective, who's a creature of the night? And what of the boatsman, whom we learn is the comic relief? Would only murders in the building make a comic relief character the killer? Let's solve only murders in the building. Season three, episode eight, sits probe. Pressure mounts on the show's most critical rehearsal day. A familiar official upends the case. Loretta's complex past threatens to upend everything else, and Charles must perform his number without going crazy. We'll be breaking down each episode for clues, suspects, and red herrings on the hunt to learn who killed Ben Glenroy. Spoilers, up through Season 3, Episode 8 for Only Murders in the Building. If you haven't seen all these episodes, pause this video, reenact your Papa Smurf Skeletor slash fic, and then come back and watch it. This week, at the end of the video, after your feedback, I'm going to review a theory based around plot characters versus joke characters. Use the timestamps below to jump to the topic or suspect you want to hear about and skip past the stuff you don't want to hear. Now, this is difficult for me to talk about because I don't want to know it, but people online are claiming that the only murders in the building season three soundtrack has been released and some of the titles of the songs actually contain future spoilers. I'm trying to solve this, so I haven't looked at the season three soundtrack. No, this type of thing has happened before. When Star Wars The Phantom Menace came out, the soundtrack came out before the movie, and the soundtrack had a title called This Character's Noble Death, which let everybody know, hey, guess who's gonna die in the movie? Once again, I'm trying to solve it, I think you're trying to solve it, so let's not look at the soundtrack. If you do, please note comments about the soundtrack on the YouTube page or on our social media accounts, at DoublePHQ on Twitter, Instagram, and Threads, Facebook.com slash DoublePHQ, Email hello at doublepmedia.com. Hey, let's begin with the opening credits Easter egg. There's a conductor on the roof. Didn't they miss a chance for a fiddler up here? Earlier this week, the online site Collider put out an article about Tobert's handwriting being the mystery clue. Um, we only see three letters of Tobert's handwriting, and Collider somehow says this handwriting matches the writing of the effing pig on the mirror. I don't see it at all. Do you guys see it? This is ridiculous. But hey, other people are speculating. Does the handwriting of B. Glenroy by either Child Ben or Child Dicky does that match the effing pig on the mirror? I don't necessarily see that either. We love doing handwriting analysis here on this podcast, but I, I don't think it's definitive proof either way. Although these G's are similar, what do you think? Let us know. Let's look at the poll results from last week's question. And sometimes I ask questions really just to ask them to see what results we could get. I asked, what was the best version of the Only Murders in the Building podcast trio? Was it the classic trio of Mabel, Charles, and Oliver? The new Bloody Mabel trio of Mabel, Taubert, and Theo? Or the OG Cinda Canning trio of Cinda, Cindy, and Poppy Becky? At the time I'm recording this, there are just under 800 votes. And as you can see, the classic trio won with 91% of the vote. That said, somehow we got 40 people to vote for the new Bloody Mabel trio. Tobert, Mabel, Theo, 40 people like you guys after one episode, best. 
And this is the best. 32 of you voted for the OG Cinda Canning Trio, which included evil killer Poppy Becky, who killed Sweet Bunny. Oh my goodness, heck yeah. Love crazy results. Before we run down the suspects, let's see what episode 8 taught us about the victim. Actor Ben Glenn Roy. Ben Stalker Greg, he's been set free. We learn another bit of new information on opening night, and it's kind of hinted, but I think we can agree that this fight happened before the play. Ben and Dickie had a huge fight. Ben said Dickie was dead to him. What is going on? What caused this fight with Dickie? What caused this fight with Loretta? Is Tobert somehow involved in this? What changed? What came up? Now let's run down the suspects. First up, maybe a suspect who doesn't exist, Ben too. Does the twin theory have to get tossed out now? Certainly the parents who wrote to Loretta, who said they were having a child, they would have mentioned they were having twins. A twin would have been in this photo they mailed to Loretta. Ben too must not exist, therefore, these mismatched tattoos, you know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Forget them. Ignore them. Loretta Durkin. Loretta got the voiceover in episode 8, and back when she was young, she was voted best actress in the Midwest by her father. Later, she got pregnant by a visiting director. Now, it's highly unlikely, but did anyone assume this visiting director was Jerry Blau? To me, he's the only character who might be a New York City theater director who could be 10 years older, at least, than Loretta. Now, Jerry Blau, he doesn't seem to be interested in women, but with this show, Only Murders in the Building, never say never. After giving birth to Dickie, Loretta gave up the baby to a couple who at the time couldn't have a child. In New York City, Loretta found no instant success or delayed success. But after seeing that Ben and Dickie were coming to Broadway, Loretta forced herself into an audition to meet her baby boy, Dickie. In the present timeline, Loretta writes a letter to her son, then realizes that her scrapbook about Dickie is missing from her apartment. She confronts Oliver about the scrapbook, and Oliver does not handle this well. What do you guys think? Should Loretta forgive Oliver for going through her stuff and taking some of her stuff? When Oliver mentions to Loretta that Mabel believes Dickie could be the killer, Loretta freaks out. She tries to convince Mabel to look somewhere else, to not point the blame at Dickie. KT, what a B. Worse for Loretta is Oliver out of the blue saying the words, I love you. In her new song, Loretta talks, a nanny's only duty is to the children. Mabel and Charles, boy, they are invading her personal space, going through her purse, opening a sealed letter that she wrote to Dickie. Ooh, we love the podcast trio, but is this ethical? The episode ends with Loretta confessing to the crime to save her boy Dickie from any police questions. One final thing we gotta talk about with Loretta is this bus ticket which appeared in the final credits. It implies that this ticket from St. Louis to New York City was purchased in March of 1976. Dickie would have been well born before then. Dickie was not born in March of 1976. He was born, I'm going to assume, in 70, maybe 69. By 76, Ben would have been three years old, and therefore Ben would have been the older brother of Dickie. Unless this is truly a crazy twist, where actually Loretta is Ben's mom, not Dickie's mom, this Easter egg in the closing credits, it doesn't work with the timeline. Producer Donna. Donna is very upset that Oliver allowed critic Maxine to be there at the Sitz Probe. Donna is also not too happy about literally lighting money on fire every minute that they stay in the gooseberry. Now in a unique moment, Donna isn't really played for laughs, but we hear her gagging in the restroom, and later we see her adjust a wig. Some online have wondered if these are context clues that Donna is going through chemo. That's a big jump, but what do you think? Donna and Loretta speak in the bathroom, and it's Donna's words that move Loretta. As a mother, you can't help it. You'll do anything to make sure they're okay. Donna's son, Cliff. Cliff doesn't exactly do too much in episode 8, but look at the outfit Cliff is wearing. He'd fit in with those crazy outfits in the original movie, Mel Brooks's The Producers. Is this more fuel to the producer's theory, which we talked about way back in our video on episode 2? Ben's brother, Dickie. 
Someone wrote in this feedback, and I feel bad I can't find it anymore, so I can't give them credit. But this person wondered if the reason that Dr. C's drugs didn't show up in Ben's autopsy was because Dickie was taking those drugs, not Ben. Remember back in episode 2, Ben mentioned to Charles that he was supporting his mother and his brother. Was Ben still supporting his brother Dickie and getting him these drugs from Dr. C? I think it's a good theory. What do you think? Now again, on opening night, before Ben was poisoned, he and Dickie had a big fight. Ben said Dickie was dead to him. Dickie now says he felt free when Ben died that first time. Was this before or after Dickie ended Tobert's contract? There are some clues, now maybe I'm wrong, but it looks like while Loretta doesn't realize it, the show appears to be trying to subtly hint that Dickie already knows Loretta is his mother. The police really do pay attention to Dickie, but his mother Loretta steps in to save him from questions. Tobert. Now Tobert doesn't appear in this episode, but I got this feedback from Joy I wanted to read where she said, Tobert is my original pick. At the restaurant, he said he didn't want to stand by and watch the baby elephant die. I think that's a clue. Tobert doesn't want to stand by when there's the drama of the murder around his documentary. I think that's interesting, Joy. I would say that in the Tobert is guilty column, we don't know why he was originally fired on Death Rattle's opening night. He's conveniently not been on the scene for many important times in the show like the opening night gathering at Oliver's apartment. Tobert wasn't around for the questioning of Dickie during the silent auction. And in this week's episode, Tobert isn't around. We don't have any idea of Tobert's relationship with Ben. Do you believe we're going to learn things in next week's episode 9? Kimber, who loves doing it for the memes. Kimber played the character Roxy in Chicago. It was such a big production, Detective Williams knows about it. Ty? Again, there's just not much about Ty. He arrived on the original opening night at the Gooseberry around 5 p.m. before Kimber. Bobo! Comic relief Bobo. Has anybody laughed at anything Bobo's done this season? Comic relief. Bobo's family moved down to Florida with his one-footed mother. Bobo is treating this interview like it's therapy. Keep going, Bobo. You do you. KT. What a bee. I don't remember seeing KT in this episode, but you do hear her voice over the intercom, and she's not in her office, which Howard and Mabel commandeer. Critic Maxine. She's at the rehearsal, and this is very, this is not natural at all. I always talk about an unbelievable scene in this show. This might be the most unbelievable. What is believable is that Maxine, as a critic, would love to rip the original Death Rattle a new one. But Maxine claims the new version, Death Rattle Dazzle, is pure Oliver Putnam. Does that mean a positive review? What do you guys think? Let's hear it. Would Maxine give this show a good review? Howard Morris. It's a very quick line in the episode, but Howard's reminds us all of the Smackery's cookies. Yes, our cookie theory, you know it's coming back. You know it's true. And we said that at the end of episode three, guys. This stuff is coming true. Howard really only wants to talk to Mabel, and not just about his Papa Smurf Skeletor slash fic. He is the audience surrogate. Howard wants to be on the Only Murders in the Building podcast, don't we all? Howard realizes that something was in the paper shredder on opening night, and he starts putting it together. Let's see what we can put together from what Howard put together. It's a piece of paper with the opening night date on it, February 16th, 2023. We're going to have to guess on a lot of this, commence on something, and until and society, performing, composer, however. This could be a review, but it's impossible to tell. What do you think was shredded in the paper shredder? Come on, Howard, you have to do it. What are the words you can make out of Howard? Horde, how, hard, draw, road, ward, whoa, word, or, rad. Raw, rod, wad, war, who, or, do. You got it, Howard. Oliver Putnam. Lighten up, Oliver. You look as wooden as that lighthouse on the stage. Oh, no. Oliver, don't look wooden. You've had a heart attack. Look alive. Look alive. Oliver told Loretta he loves her. Are you guys going to be okay if this season ends in heartbreak? Is there any way the season does not end in heartbreak? What do you think? 
Let's hear it for all our Aloretta fans. Go down in the comments and let us know. Charles Hayden Savage. Charles is trying to find the piece in the original trio. All hands in. It's corny, but we love it. And hey, we don't talk about the fun on this show enough. Charles nailed the patter song. You know what? Okay. Maybe if we get 6,000 subscribers, I'll prove that I can nail the Pickwick triplet song, including all these new lyrics. Piece of cake. Mabel Mora. I got a lot of feedback like this from Nina, which said, wow, to say that Theo is much smarter than Mabel is a weird comparison and conclusion. To everybody who thinks I've been too tough on Mabel, I've said it. I have been too tough on Mabel. Mabel is brilliant. Mabel last week worked out that, hey, the time was wrong. Greg was innocent. Ben died at 12.26 a.m. Mabel is so smart. It's just to me, when those moments, the show has her not as smart as that. It's tougher. And so I should be attacking these writers instead of Mabel. Writers, let Mabel always be smart. Do you think it's smart that Mabel has been crashing at Theo's? Is that a sign that maybe she and Theo might develop more? Or is it just a sign that, hey, it's way too quick for her to move in with Tobert? What do you guys think? Now let's get to your feedback, and we're going to go over some things where people got into many debates in our feedback. Hot Shoujo gave us feedback that a lot of people said. They wrote, Let me just say how happy I was to see Theo again. I really like him, and his redemption is really good. Also, his interaction with Mabel was so cute. A lot of people felt that way. On the flip side, we had Sue Perb, who gave this feedback, I like character redemption, but Theo is a bridge too far. He is Mabel's bestie somehow, but remember season one? He threatened and kidnapped Mabel, killed her best friend, blackmailed Tim, framed Oscar to spend years in prison, and we haven't even gotten to him and his dad doing the grave robbing. Sure, Teddy, the father, was pushing that, but Theo was a grown man. The entitlement in which he walks relatively free in comparison to Oscar makes my stomach churn. I see both sides. If this was real life, I would never forgive Theo. Because this is a show, somehow I'm going along with, okay, let's redeem Theo. The actor seems like a cool guy, so maybe that's why. What do you guys think? Do we need a full-blown redeem Theo? Theo can't be redeemed. Debate down in the YouTube comments. Let us know. A user, I believe the handle is Amay Barnes, wrote, I have a super weird and probably totally wrong theory, but hear me out. I keep thinking, why is this fish named President McKinley? And why do we see so much and hear so much about the fish? So I was thinking, what is significant about the real President McKinley? One small connection I found that when McKinley was shot and killed, his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, took over. Theodore, also known as Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore and Teddy Demas. Oh my goodness, are they going to kill President McGinley? We got feedback from Ella who wrote, In the second episode, where we see Charles and Mabel discussing possible ways that Ben was killed, we see Ben falling from the 10th floor in the Arconia, not from his penthouse floor of the building. Was he pushed, or did the mystery person try to grab him to save him from falling? A bit like Theo on the roof with Zoe in Series 1. Did they push Ben? And in the sequence that shows Ben falling at the beginning of episode two, both his hands are empty, yet his corpse is grasping a death rattle hanky. Excellent point, Ella. Should we believe that Ben was pushed from the 10th floor? Who lives on the 10th floor in the Arconia? Oliver does. And that's where the party was, the opening night party for death rattle. It was on the 10th floor. Was Ben killed right after he left the party? Doesn't seem possible or even probable. But what do you guys think? A lot of people wrote and made this point that Jenny B does. Somebody explain how you have a clock set ahead 20 minutes and then you're constantly 20 minutes late, fashionably late. For everybody who submitted this type of feedback, you're correct. It doesn't make logical sense. Dickie said his brother set his clock ahead 20 minutes, but he also arrived 20 minutes late doesn't really make sense. I don't know what to say. Unless Dickie was implying Ben always showed up an hour late. Who knows? But I do believe we can trust that 1226 is the time when Ben died. We got this feedback from the makeup chair who gave a good point. If there's a twin, Ben 1 and Ben 2, then wouldn't both Bens have to have a watch set 20 minutes early? The Art of Intuition gave us this feedback. They wrote, Dickie or Loretta being the killer would seem so obvious at this point. I'm expecting a big twist at the end. Dickie mentioning that he was not watching Ben that night. Why? Did they have a fight? We saw Dickie leave with Ben from the opening night party at Oliver's. 
I got three people who wrote in to defend season two from the no symbolism theory that I pointed out last week. Finola wrote, Poppy had a dysfunctional relationship with her father and ultimately wanted to get away. That tied into the symbolism of the season. Meg wrote, Season 2 was about fathers. Poppy Becky used Cindy Canning's podcast to escape from her alcoholic, abusive father. This season is focused on mothers. And Irish Ted wrote, There was plenty of child-parent issues with Poppy in Season 2. She was partially escaping living with her father. In this case, we're just going to have to happily agree to disagree. We did find out that Poppy didn't want to live with her father anymore, but we learned that in episode 10, the same episode where we learned Poppy was the killer, the same episode where we learned Poppy somehow knew about the secret passages in the Arconia, even though many people who lived there multiple years never knew about them. I consider that kind of a cop-out, but the show did put in that Poppy didn't want to live with her abusive father. Now back to season three. Mean Bob wrote, I was certain it was Dicky from the start, simply given how unusual it would be for him to be conveniently absent from the exact moment that someone else killed his brother. But now after episode seven, it looks like the show is pointing the finger at Dicky too early. Is this a fake out or real? What do you guys think? Now, I believe we mentioned the producer's theory back in our video on episode two, but Elizabeth wrote that she just finally watched the movie, the 1967 movie, The Producers, for the first time. And in that movie, spoiler for this great movie, one of the producers actually suggests to the playwright that he kill the actors because that would cause the play to end. If you haven't seen The Producers, watch it like Elizabeth did. I asked her and she said she really enjoyed the movie. This next bit of feedback is going to get us into the plot versus jokes theory. And it's from Glenn, who wrote, The most obvious suspects to me are Donna and Cliff, especially with the producers referenced so heavily in episode 7. If Donna and Cliff want the show to fail, then hiring Oliver as the director and murdering the star, and then casting nightmare Matthew Broderick, all those moves seem like effective strategies to make sure the play ends. <laughs> So here we go with the plot versus jokes theory. This show, you have to kind of consider things that aren't necessarily clues. For example, we know Ben was pushed down the elevator shaft at 12.26 a.m. But really, for all our main suspects, we have no idea where they were at 12.26 a.m. The podcast trio never goes to asking people, where were you at the time of the crime? Like, alibis mean nothing. The only thing 1226 has proven is that stalker Greg didn't kill Ben. And we kind of knew that, right? So if every suspect is viable, you kind of have to piece together the solution to who killed Ben through stuff besides hard evidence and facts. If you look at only murders in the building's history, you have the core trio, Mabel, Charles, and Oliver. Then every other character on the show functions in one of two ways. Either they're serious characters or well-rounded characters who are there to introduce plot arcs, or they're characters like on The Simpsons, where they're kind of joke machines. If you look at season one, look at Howard. He was the crazy cat guy, right? He's like a character on The Simpsons. He had a frozen cat leg in his freezer. He's there so they can do wacky neighbor jokes. Uma and Bunny, I've already mentioned how they were like Patty and Selma from The Simpsons. These characters exist so the writers can make jokes about the wacky neighbors in the Arconia. Hey, Dr. Grover Stanley, he keeps wanting to sell you therapy sessions, right? In season one, Cinda and her team of podcasters, as well as the fans, the Arconiacs, they're introduced so the show could make jokes about podcast and podcast fans and that kind of stuff. Zazz exists so you can make fun of Charles's ego, right? Like all these things. I'm not saying that they're only there for jokes, there is a little rounding to them, but they're really here for jokes and for laughs. In season one, on the flip side, you had these plot type characters. Oscar, Teddy, Theo, Jan. Some of those characters, like Oscar and Jan, they're really emotional foils for Mabel and Charles. Or they tie into the murder plot, or red herring plots, like about Zoe's death, Teddy and Theo. And once again, just because they're on the plot side doesn't mean they can't make you laugh. Teddy made you laugh. Jan made you laugh. Especially when Jan was revealed as the killer, she kind of became a Simpson-esque character, right? But they are really more serious types of characters. Now, when season one was over, who killed Zoe? What happened to Zoe? The people involved were on the serious side, the plot side, Theo and Teddy. Who killed Tim Kono? Once again, that person was on the serious side, like Jan. Now you go to season two. Lucy, here's a new character on the serious side. Alice, Nina, Kreps. So you would think, okay, the killer's gonna come from the serious side again. But notice what happened. Some of these joke characters, like Marv the superfan and Poppy, they started becoming more serious, right? 
Marv had a daughter he wanted to impress. While he really had been nothing but a joke until this point, suddenly you're giving him this daughter, you're giving him this shading to be more serious, and he starts moving towards the plot side. And look at Poppy in season two. Yeah, she had a couple of jokes, but suddenly in season two, episode six, she's warning Mabel, hey, be careful, you could be in trouble, and moving away from just being jokes into plot. At the end of season two, at episode nine, where the show was pretty much telling you the killer is either Cinda or Poppy, it was obvious that Poppy was the killer because she had moved from being the joke character to the plot side, where Cinda was still really mainly the joke character. Why is all of this important? Well, look at season three characters. Once again, it's not that Loretta isn't funny, she was hilarious at the table read, but she's really here for emotional stakes for Oliver. She's here about the plot, how is she related to people, right? Look at Dickie, he's not really funny at all, he's about plot, he's jealous of his brother. Then look at Donna and Cliff. So far, through eight episodes, to me, they feel really on the joke side. They're kissing, dicky stress dances. I mean, these guys are obviously silly characters based around a snooty Broadway producer and her man-child son, right? But if they start moving towards the plot side, if they start making those characters more serious, is that a sign that they are the killers? That one of them is the killer? What do you guys think? Where would you put the characters in season three? In the plot side of the arc? or the joke side of the arc? Let me know down in the comments. Guys, we don't have much time. We've got to solve this now. Join us next week when we talk about Season 3, Episode 930, having amassed a plethora of clues, suspects, and theories, but no concrete answers about Bent's murder. The trio devise a peculiar method of recreating the final moments of his life. We gotta go, Clue Crew. Arconiacs, this is our time. Let's solve only murders in the building.